Well, a handful of times every year, we'll bring in a guest preacher, somebody who's just been doing effective ministry in different parts of the world, different parts of our country. And almost always when we bring in those guest communicators, I'm gone because I'm preaching somewhere else. But I'm here because of what I preached earlier in this series about how every relationship is better if you can have fun, play, joy, and delight. And Ed Stetcher and his wife Donna are people like that in our life. Sherry and I love to be with them anytime we're together. And it's not very often, but when we are, we just have fun because we love the Lord and we care about each other. And so Ed Stetcher is here to bring the message today. And I want to share a little bit about him. I don't share about him uh, so it will impress you. I share so you know where he's coming from and so you can pray for him and pray for his ministry. And so about nine months ago, Ed became the dean over the Talbot School of Theology, which also has oversight over Biola University. This is one of the best theological training centers and Christian colleges in the world today. And he's in the role of kind of leadership over that and having a huge influence there. And so pray for him in that, but that's his, his ministry context. Also, uh, he does a radio program every Saturday morning on Moody Radio that's heard all over the country, all over the world. And we got to do that together yesterday here. Uh, and did that uh, radio program yesterday. And on top of that, uh, he's kind of the senior chief editor over Outreach Magazine, which is, I think, one of the best resources out there helping pastors and leaders know how to really move out with the gospel of Jesus, which is really what this church is all about. And so for those reasons and lots of others, and on top of that, uh, Ed really loves his wife. He has three daughters, and he really loves them. He loves his family. He loves his wife. He loves Jesus. And that makes him fit good into this church. And so will you join me in prayer, both for Ed and his life and ministry, but also for his bringing the message today, and will you join me in praying for yourselves and myself that we would hear what God wants to say to us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for Ed, for Donna, for the girls, for their family that do ministry together, really. If, he, if we're in ministry, the whole family's part of it, and I thank you for how they have faithfully served you for so many years. We pray that today you would anoint Ed's words. Lord, he's prepared a message just for today, just for this sermon series. He's written a new sermon because, Lord, you've called him to bring this message today. And I believe he is exactly the right person to share these words with us. So would you open our hearts to receive, our ears to hear, our lives to be impacted, and Ed to bring the message you've prepared through him. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Will you please welcome Ed Stetzer? Well, we're talking about whole relationships, and we've been having these conversations around the coffee table. Uh, perhaps you've, uh, you've been, maybe a table like this uh, brings you joy. You think about the times when maybe you and your mom had great conversations, or, or maybe you were with your, your friend, and, and you built some beautiful relational time together. Or maybe for you, it's, it's a little bit like, oh, man, I've had a lot of conflict, et cetera, et cetera, and, and so this doesn't bring back a good memory for you, right? So, so but you know, it's not an uncommon thing. You got, you got this, you got some coffee. I don't drink coffee because coffee's gross, but, um, but you, it's, it's bitter water for bitter people, but you guys keep drinking it all you want. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, I, I heard a pastor once do a message, and the message was entitled, How to Get Along with Everyone All the Time. And I thought it was kind of an overpromise um, because the reality is, is nobody gets along with everybody all the time. The reality is relationships are con con uh, complicated and sometimes conflicted. And, and so how are we going to think about relationships throughout this series. Well, we're in the midst of a series. If you're a guest of Shoreline, we're glad you're here. If you're joining us online, we welcome you as well if it's your first time. And we're doing a series on whole relationships. You can find them all at our website as you go through that today. My topic today is, of course, related to the theme, which is whole relationships, but one slice of that. And the particular slice of that I'm talking about today is the lost art of spiritual connections. Now, mind you, there's lots of ways you're going to connect with people. Not all of them are on a spiritual basis. The reality is you need to learn to, if you're a college student, I work at a university, by a university, you need to learn to get, a, get along with your roommate, right? So that's a relationship. If you're, if, if you're married, you're going, to, you're going to be learning about each other your whole lives, right? Getting to know one another. Don and I have been married for more than 35 years, and we're still getting to know each other. Like, like yesterday, I learned something new about Donna Stetzer. And so you, you learn things all the time as well. But also, too, I'm going to focus specifically on the lost art of spiritual relationships because people often are looking for connectedness in all different kinds of ways. In fact, let me show you some statistics. I used to work at a research company called Lifeway Research. I was the president of, of a company called Lifeway Research. That's how I first met Kevin. We, we did polls and research and, and more. And so I, I love polls. I love statistics. Now, I want you to know that 87% of statistics are actually made up on the spot. So... 
So when you hear a stat, you want to be a little sure of its source. Not my statistics, right? I love statistics. And uh, every time I quote a stat, an angel actually gets its wings. And so I'm going to quote... I'm going to quote a couple of stats here and put them on the screen, but they're from the Pew Research Center. Pew Research Center in December released this in December 23. I'm going to just quote. It says, we asked respondents to tell us whether they pursue a variety of activities, such as meditating and spending time in nature, for reasons that might be considered spiritual, such as making connection with something bigger than themselves, or to connect with their, quote, true self, unquote. And it's interesting. So this is actually a graph. Let me put it on the screen. Americans pursue a range of activities to foster such connections, right? So this is the percent of adults who say they do each of the following monthly or more often mainly to feel connected with their true self or something bigger than themselves or with other people. And for the vast majority, as you say, the large plurality of people, it's actually spending time inward and centering themselves, which I think is a good thing, right? In a sense, as we have our quiet time, we're recentering on the Lord, we're getting uh, walking in peace that passes all understanding. But some say, uh, 26% say spending time in nature, 22% say meditate, 7% say exercise, 4% say practice yoga, right? So it's interesting, too, that they, they also distinguish, right? They distinguish between a spiritual and religious community in some of the research. 14% of Americans say they are involved in a spiritual community, including 8% who say they're involved in a spiritual community and that it's extremely or important to them. And you contrast that, but 4 in 10 U.S. adults say they're involved in a religious community, such as a church or a religious congregation, and, uh, and this is a much more common expression that people have. But it's interesting to me how many look um, inward to find connection, often connecting with their true self. Matter of fact, 27% of U.S. adults look inward monthly, mainly to connect with their true self. We actually asked them, they asked them different ways of answering this question. Spend time looking inward or centering themselves at least a few times a month. So to find their true self is very common compared with other people is a much, it's a much lower number. Now, why is that? Today we see a strong focus on individualism and sort of finding oneself, right? And so we see kind of you do you, uh, you, you, you do what works for you, find your truth. And simultaneously in our culture, we see people actually pushing back on the idea of uh, maybe religion that's too legalistic or traditional, leading many younger people to sort of deconstruct their faith. Yet I think that we all need in all times a deep authentic spiritual connection, and that's what I want to focus on today. We're going to do that by looking at some biblical passages. So if you have a Bible, you can take one out or turn one on. It'll also be on the screen as we walk through this together, because I think we're made for connection, but the way we're made reminds us that that begins with a right connection with God. St. Augustine, St. Augustine, once famously said, we sort of, we kind of paraphrase this, that all of us have a God-shaped hole in us that we get try to fill. Uh, Augustine actually said it this way. He said, you have made us, O God, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in you. So well, let's look at this, and we're going to walk through three things together. If you're a note taker, I'll have three main points in my message. And number one, we're going to look first and foremost at God's way. We're going to look at God's way, and we're going to look at a really beautiful passage that you may have read. If you're a Bible reader, maybe you read through the Bible, my guess is you read this passage and maybe you recognize part of it, but sometimes we read through passages like this and we kind of move through them quickly because they're kind of about the people rather than about maybe stuff that we would say might apply to us. But I want you to see how rich this passage is in spiritual connection between a guy named Paul, who's the apostle who's writing this letter, and a guy named Timothy, who's kind of his son in the Lord, right? his child in the Lord. And I want you to see how rich this is, right? And the big picture of our message today is that God wants you to be connected with him, with other Christians, and with non-Christians. And we're going to look at 2 Timothy and some in Genesis to help us see why that's true. So the Apostle Paul in his life and writing showed a powerful connection to God, but also a powerful connection to others. So we're going to look at these two passages in 2 Timothy to see his relationship, well, with Timothy, who it's written to, to see his relationship with Timothy and the power of spiritual connection between these two early leaders in the church and also their relationship with God. It'll be on the screen as we go. 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is Christ Jesus, 
to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my son, Christ Jesus our Lord, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I am now persuaded now lives in you. It's kind of a fascinating passage but one that is easy for sometimes people to skip. It's like the end of the book of Romans when Paul's writing and he says, say hi to so-and-so and and say hi to so-and-so. And And you're like, well, that's not me. Does that relate to me? But this passage is given in the inspired and inerrant word of God. If it's in the Bible, it's for our instruction and for our benefit. So let's look at what it says today. We'll just walk through 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 1, it starts at the beginning. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, right? He talks about the will of God. He talks about the promise of life that is in Christ. Paul's mission was to make known the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was convinced that the real and deep spiritual connection that he calls the promise of life here begins only with a relationship with Jesus. We're going to keep coming back to that here. If you want to have whole relationships, it begins with the right relationship with God. In verse 2, it says, Paul addressed Timothy as my true son, which is interesting because he's not his biological son, but he addresses him as my true son and my dear son here, my true son in 1 Timothy. And the expression, my dear son, shows the really the spiritual connection that was there, the intimacy of their relationship, right? Um, and there's a bond between Paul and Timothy, a special bond between them, that, and maybe even an unlikely or uniquely close bond, and he's like a, a father to a son, like a mentor to a mentee. I love that. So I heard a preacher once say that everybody needs a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. But let me explain that for just a second. This might be something that sticks with you and you remember. In the Bible, we are learning about Paul and Timothy right now. Barnabas is a uh, unique character in a lot of ways because he's primarily known for his encouragement. Matter of fact, his name literally means son of encouragement, and he just acts that way. He's always encouraging other people and more. You know, I find, I, find, I find Kevin and Cherry that way as well. I find them to just be consistent encouragers to us. They're like, come up here, we'll preach, come hang out with them. We're staying with them, right? They want to be encouragers. I, I hope you know how blessed you are to have encouragers leading you as a church. I'm, I'm so thankful for them. So thankful for you guys so, so very much. Are you thankful for them? I thought you were. Um, but that's just part of some people's wiring. And so, so you got this Paul, uh, you got this Timothy. Everyone needs a Paul, someone who's speaking into their life, like an older mentor, like, like, a, like a father in the Lord, and, and in some cases a mother in the Lord. In fact, the Bible actually says that. At one place, the Bible says that older women should mentor younger women, which is a beautiful thing. The problem is we can't find any women who admit to being older women. But the Bible actually says that. So what an opportunity to mentor other people. So everyone needs a Paul. Everyone needs a Timothy, right? Someone you're speaking into their life. Someone who's maybe starting new on the journey. You're helping them out. You're kind of encouraging them along the way. And everyone needs a Barnabas, someone who's encouraging them. I love that. Let's keep going through 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. So Paul follows a pretty typical pattern here in verse 3. He goes from a salutation, like a greeting, to a thanksgiving, but it gets really personal in verse 3. He says, you know, I, I, he says, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I constantly remember you in my prayers. I love that. He talks about his own ancestors, but then he's praying regularly. In verse 4, he says this. He, he gets, again, real personal. Paul mentions Timothy's tears. He doesn't give reason for them. We don't know why, but shows, again, the depth of their relationship, the spiritual connection that's there between Paul and Timothy. And I want you to have spiritually deep connections with other followers of Jesus. I think that's really important. We want to have those spiritually deep connections. Just, again, he must have been with Timothy long enough to know his hurts and his struggles. And I I think, you see, most people sort of want that. Most people want to be able to have the relationship where they're like, you know, I'm sitting down with somebody, I'm building community with somebody, but here's the challenge. It takes investment and work on your part. You know, we just moved here. So we're just, we moved from Chicago, uh, where I served for the last seven years as a dean at Wheaton College, and we moved to Southern California. And, and it's a different world. We, we learned a few things. First of all, we, did, we do know now that the West Coast is the best coast. That's important for us to know, right? 
But it takes time to make connections with people. And so it's different maybe some ways than in the Midwest or where we lived before was Nashville or where I grew up outside of New York City. And so it takes time to make connections. So for us, we knew that the way we were going to make connections in the life of our church down in Southern California was to get involved in a small group. So I'm, I, you might say, well, Ed, you, you go to chapel. You have chapel five times a week at, at the university. You're, you're working in a Christian environment. You, 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 you work and you speak into pastors. Why do you need to be in a small group? Because if I'm going to have these kind of spiritual connections with people, I can't just do it sitting in rows facing forward like shelves at Walmart. I've got to move from sitting in rows to sitting in circles to getting in community with other people. Paul and Timothy had that kind of community. In verse 5, we see even more about this. It says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. Right, we're going to talk about how Jesus fits into all this, right? Which was first lived in your grandmother Lois, and then, excuse me, and then in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. So clearly, there's a spiritual connection between Christians that I'm encouraging you towards today. Now, but it's not just about that spiritual connection with Christians. I, it's about a spiritual connection with God, Christians, and we're going to see also in non-Christians. Matter of fact, while we're here in 2 Timothy, we just have to go a couple of chapters back, and we can see some about the non-Christians here as well. In 2 Timothy 4, 5, it says this, but you keep your head in all situations. That's great advice for an election year in 2024. Right, keep your head in all situations. We feel that, right? So, and it says, endure hardship. Maybe you feel that as the cultures become more negative towards Christianity and more secular, right? This is how we're dealing with other people. The Bible somebody says outsiders. We'll say people who don't yet follow Christ. Do the work of an evangelist, which actually in the original language is better translated, do your work in evangelistic ways. So all of us can do that. One of the things I like about organic outreach, and I love that I, you, I didn't know this Sunday you were going to highlight organic outreach. And i got to tell you, the fact that your church has been a part of blessing over 40,000 pastors is really a stunning and amazing thing. This church in Monterey is impacting the whole world because of your partnership in the gospel. And I love that so much. That's such a key thing. So, But what I want you not to miss is, is that one of the things they talk about this, and we talk about this on the radio, and our radio is not, our show is not here in Monterey. We're on about 250 stations around the country. So you can listen, though, if you go to edstetzerlive.com, and you can listen to Kevin and me talk about this. And we we start the show, we had great calls, it was a great conversation, but we start the show by talking about how in organic outreach they talk about just turn the temperature up a few degrees in the way you share the gospel. All of us can do that. You've heard Kevin talk about that. All of us can do that. Well, this is this passage, right? Do your work in evangelistic ways. So Paul gives some imperatives here for some commands, some directions about how Timothy, remember Paul's writing to Timothy, shows his love for him and his love for the Lord in the first part of the book, and at the end of the book tells him to engage people who don't know the Lord as well. Now why? Why do these spiritual connections matter? Well, we can actually go all the way back to creation. God made a beautiful world in creation and made us unique in that world. And I told you we're going to go back and forth between 2 Timothy and Genesis, so let's look at Genesis chapter 1. Here's what it says. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. That's a key phrase, in our image, in our likeness. So they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the air, the livestock, the wild animals, over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. See how that's repeated? That's really a key thing. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So we're created in the image of God, which we sometimes say the Imago Dei. Matter of fact, I'd like you to say that. I'm gonna say, I want you to ask you just a minute to say Imago Dei with me. If you're out on the patio, if you're in the worship center, if you're watching online, say those two words with me together. It's, it's words from Latin. Let's say it together. Imago Dei. One more time. Imago Dei. So we're made in the image of God, which includes a call to spiritual connection, but clearly something has gone wrong. I mean, you can't do it on your own. No man, no woman is an island. But when things get broken, and things are broken spiritually, they're broken relationally and physically and vocationally and emotionally. Remember in week one, Pastor Kevin talked about the great commandment, and he talked about how God made us to have a relationship with him vertically, love the Lord, and with others horizontally, love your neighbor, but then something 
has broken that reality. That leads us to number two on our outline. Broken ways, broken ways. Remember, God wants you to be connected with him, with other Christians, and with non-Christians. That's those spiritual connections. But, but the problem has become real because the world and relationships are now broken. Matter of fact, if we go back to 2 Timothy for just a second, 2 Timothy, Paul writes and actually talks about our day, our time. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, it says, For a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their desires, they'll gather around them a number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Now, can I tell you if there's something that describes our day, right? We have far too many people being discipled by their cable news choices. They're being spiritually shaped by their social media. They're actually being shaped into that image rather than the image of Christ that then leads us to spiritually connect with God, with other Christians, and with non-Christians as well. So how do we get to 2 Timothy? And well, we can actually answer that by going back again to Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So we know the rest of the story. Probably even if you haven't been to church before, you know the rest of the story. We call that theologically the fall. God made a beautiful world in creation with a special relationship with humanity. He had one tree there to avoid and he gave them a beautiful and bountiful world to enjoy. But the certain serpent tempted them. They responded, Adam and Eve responded, and sin came in bringing brokenness, what we call the fall, right? Because Adam and Eve were now separated from God because of sin. They're separated from God, broken, faced death. Adam and Eve had actually walked in the garden naked and unashamed, and now they were filled with guilt and shame. Guilt, what we've done, shame about who we are. And so we feel that. We feel the brokenness of the world all around us. So for some of you, this little coffee table represents a beautiful time of relationship. For some of you, it brings back painful memories of broken relationships that you saw explode around the coffee table. Because we see that, we feel that, we know the brokenness that we can experience. Don and I were observing some of that yesterday. Now, don't misunderstand, we have that in our lives as well, but we were sitting at Lover's Point. Now, I don't know if you go to Lover's Point there in Pacific Grove, and we had a, we had a lovely time. We, uh, Kevin had got to give us places to go visit, and we're, well, we made a mistake. The mistake we made was we went when you have a marathon coming. <laughs> so there, I'm guessing there were more people than normal. So we started by trying to find parking, and some of the cha- went through one parking lot and went out, and, and I got to tell you, the world is broken when you can't find parking spaces. I felt that, and then we, we went up and we climbed on the rocks and we went and we went to that little shop there to get some coffee. And uh, not, not for me, because as you heard, I don't partake in such sin. Um, I'm, I'm a Diet Coke guy, breakfast of champions there, right there. I don't, probably way worse for me. But, but so Donna's waiting in line to get coffee and it's going on and on and on. The long line is a result of the broken world. But while I was sitting at the little table, little benches if you've been there, I mean little benches around the table, what we got to experience was a full-blown broken relationship in the table next to us that the volume escalated to the point that everybody around us knew. Now, if that's you, I'm sorry that I'm using you as an example today. (laughs) But based on the language, I'm guessing it was not you. I could be wrong. But the relationship, I mean, there was, they were yelling and they were unhappy with each other and it was all, and I was like, this is lover's lane, people. And as you know, historically, that was actually lovers of Jesus lane. But I wasn't hearing a lot of Jesus and a lot of love taking place right there today. Well, here's the thing. Uh, we, we've had that. Don and I have had arguments. And, and, and we, I mean, again, not, not all of us are, 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 are perfect like Ken and Barbie. I mean, Kevin and Sherry. Because... Uh, well, Kevin is no Ken. Uh, the, uh, I'm just Ken. Anyway, so the brokenness we all feel, we all feel it in our relationships. I have it. You have it. The brokenness all around it. Adam and Eve tried to fix themselves. Well, we can't fix ourselves, right? We see that all around us, the broken nature of relationships. We can't fix ourselves. This is why the gospel is such good news. 
So the source of spiritual connection comes not because you want to turn over a new leaf. Maybe you actually saw this series and said, I've not been to church before. I'm going to come to this church. Maybe I've heard good things about Shoreline. If they're doing something on relationships, I want to come here, something on relationships, because I have problems with relationships. What I want to say to you, if you have problems with relationships, in some level we all do, but maybe you have a lot of problems with relationships, the first step to addressing your relational problems is to get in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And in doing so, it changes everything. So we can hide our brokenness through social media likes. We can try to drown it in alcohol or addiction. We can replace it with relationships which are broken. Because people are hungry for spiritual connections. They're hungry for it. And you can relate to why. So we were, I mean, and they'll call it all different ways, right? We, 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 we make spiritual connections with people in all different kinds of ways. People get involved in sexual relationships, multiples maybe sexual relationships over time because they want that spiritual bond with somebody. Uh, people end up in doing things with other people that they don't need to be doing, drugs and alcohol. We, we were actually, yesterday we went to the, the breakfast club, right? We went to the breakfast club. We just go everywhere Kevin tells us to go. We're like mindless automatons. Where should we go now? And we go... Because we're not from here. And so we, we went there. And one of the things I learned about California that's different than where I'm from before is you guys smoke a lot of weed. <laughs> so I come out of the breakfast club, and it's just like, hello, Mary Jane. And so, so we're walking. And so, but I'm, you know, I'm kind of a blurter. So Don and I are walking to the car. And I'm like, man, it smells like weed out here. And well, the, the people were right there. I didn't see them at that time. They were in the car next to us, three of them, window down, which is technically, uh, they, before that, they were called hot boxing, so the kids know what that is. And you shouldn't, but you, maybe you do. So, so I just, you know, it's too late. They're all laughing because they see me say it. So I just engage in conversation with them because they're already giving me a slight buzz. So... But, you know, I thought to myself, here's three people, in a sense, trying to find a spiritual connection through some sort of high that ultimately, in relationship with other people, in right relationship with God, they could walk in a joy and a peace that passes all understanding, not one artificially produced by weed in a car. Does that make sense? So how do we get to this kind of relationship? God wants you to be connected with him, with other Christians, and with non-Christians. And I think we get there by getting to health and healing. Number three in our outline is health and healing. God wants you connected with him, with other Christians, and with non-Christians. And I think it's all related. There's one of our favorite little musicals. is called uh, Les Mis, and it says in this, this song in there, to love another person is to touch the face of God. And I don't know if that's 100% theologically correct, but my point is there's a connection that's there. And bringing spiritual dimension to these connections, to God, which has to be a spiritual connection to others, which can be through other Christians and then through non-Christians, is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So if your relationships are broken, I want to take you to Joel chapter 2, verse 13. Here's what it says. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And if you want to be slow to anger and abounding in love, the first place of fixing often broken relationships you have with others is to write your relationship with the God of the universe who is slow to anger and abounding in love. But we don't think that way in a slow, uh, in a kind of a self-centered culture. We're slow to respond well to spiritual things. But over and over again, we see in the Bible the call for God's people to act differently. Now, here's the reality. When I come back to this table, some of you have experienced the brokenness around a table like this. Some of you experienced the beauty around a table like this. And some of you experienced it in your marriage. Some of you experienced it in your family. Some of you experienced it in church. Some of you experienced the joys of relationships in churches and marriages and families. And some of you experienced the brokenness and the hurt, including in churches and more. So how do we, how do we walk through that? Well, the Bible teaches about these kinds of relationships. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, consider others, value others above yourselves, not looking out for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Imagine if we had a church where we looked at one another in that way. We said, let me serve you. Let me put you first as well. In our anxious culture, we can focus on encouraging one another. Look at Romans chapter 12. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. So I would invite you, if you don't know Christ, to 
Start there. Have a spiritual connection with God. You know him by faith. You grow to know him through his word, through worship, through prayer. Uh, not, not, not just to know, know more about God, but to know God more. And, and then share your love for his church, the bride of Christ as well. That's, that's part of how we step in. And that leads to those relationships. So how then can we have spiritual connections with others? Well, let me give you just a few things as we close our message that may be helpful. How can we have spiritual connections with others? Well, one is to empathize with compassion. I mean, if you'll ask the question, what are they going through? How can I help? That just makes all the difference in the world. Think about the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan who went to meet the need, not walking by the need, but went to meet the need. That's how we can do that when serving others. It's also a great opportunity to evangelize with gentleness, to evangelize with gentleness. Now, I know your church has a, a passion and a focus on that, and I'm so glad that you do. I wish more churches had the passion and focus that your church does, but maybe you need to be reminded from time to time that, that you too want to do so with love, with grace, with truth, and with gentleness. Look at Colossians 4.6. It says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. What a great way to engage spiritually with non-Christians. I, I used to work at the Billy Graham Center until uh, nine months ago, and Billy Graham once said this, I'm convinced the greatest act of love we can perform for people is to tell them about God's love for them in Christ. And this is a great year for that. Be a winsome ambassador in 2024, not a, not a social media jerk, not someone who's, who's always angry, but, but, but you know, not someone who's always feeling that they have to, have to yell at everybody about everything, right? I, I get it, I get it, right? Sometimes people think in politics that the, the, the mean social media post telling people who disagree with you that they're all dumb is the strategy. Well, I, I don't know, I don't have all the answers about every political dimension, but here's what I do know. As followers of Jesus, what a great opportunity to build bridges with people who don't know Jesus and, not shockingly, act and believe like people who don't follow Jesus. So connect with them spiritually. And then I'd say engage in hospitality. Engage in hospitality. We saw that right at the end, just before Kevin and I came up. Suddenly, at the end of that video, it quoted Romans 12, 13. Practice hospitality. What a great way to make spiritual connections with Christians. Build community, get in a small group, connect with a small group, host a small group, get, get connected with others. Practice hospitality with non-Christians to make spiritual connections with them as well. 1 Peter 4.9 reminds us, it says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. So God wants us to be connected with him, and maybe that's what you needed to hear today in the message. Your relationships have really struggled, you need to get closer to Jesus. You know what happens when you get closer to Jesus? You grow in what's called the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know what those nine things will do for you? They'll build your relationships much stronger as well. So if you're stuck, grow closer to Jesus. Great thing for all of us to do. God wants you connected with him, with other Christians, right? So let's find ways to move from sitting in rows to sitting in circles to being in community with one another and also with, with non-Christians. So God wants to be connected with you. If you're not a follower of Jesus and wants to grow that connection with you if you are. So my encouragement to you is to take whatever part of the message is for you today and say, where are the spiritual connections that I need to strengthen? And my guess is for all of us, we want to grow closer to the Lord. So let's just say that part up front. Lord, I want to grow closer to you. And then you might also say, part of what maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you or convicting you of today is I need to grow closer to God's people. Maybe I've been on the, on the spiritual outskirts of the Shoreline Church community, or, or maybe, I, maybe I haven't been at all engaged or involved. Maybe this is my first time, but I know I need to get into fellowship, spiritual connection with Christians. Well, I want to invite you, and Pastor Kevin just a minute going to come tell you ways you can connect. But then also, I want to encourage you not to forget the spiritual connections that we're called to make to non-Christians as well, to show and share the love of Jesus to a broken and hurting world. Would you pray with me and let's then ask the Lord to prompt us how we might respond? Lord, we thank you that by your grace and your goodness, you've redeemed us and called us by name and sent us on a mission for your name's sake. And as followers of Jesus, for those who are followers of Jesus, Lord, draw us closer and closer to you knowing that we're changed to be more like Jesus as we draw close to you. Father, I pray for those who may not know you today. And if the Lord's prompting your heart that you don't know Christ, this is an opportunity for you to say, to call out on him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. I want you to be my Savior. 
and I trust and follow you as my Lord. Father, I pray for those who are rightly beginning a relationship with you today, and I rejoice with them as that relationship will change all their other relationships. Just with your head bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment, I want to ask, is there, is there a calling that God has in your life to spiritually connect more deeply with other Christians? Have you been loosely or really non-connected to the life, the Christian life with other believers? A shoreline been something you come maybe as a customer and a consumer, but you're not a co-laborer working together on a journey with other Christians? Well, maybe in the quietness of this moment, the Holy Spirit might be prompting you to say, I'm going to make spiritual connections with other Christians. And Pastor Kevin's going to tell you how in just a minute because we have ways for you to do that. And I also want to ask you just for a moment, if you're a follower of Jesus, to think with me on your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your family who don't know Christ. They too need your spiritual connection. Spiritual connections that come because you're doing your work and living your life in evangelistic ways, as Paul writes to Timothy. Lord, help us to love others. Help us to build relationship more deeply with you, more deeply with other Christians, and more deeply with those who don't know you, so that in doing so, our changed lives might lead ultimately to a changed world. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen and amen. We thank Ed for bringing the word today. Thank you. Before I have you stand and send you off with a word of blessing, just a couple important things. One is just out of uh, the message you brought today, Ed, there's lots of ways to start connecting. And I want to tell you, we've got some tables out in the courtyard uh, that you can look at before you leave and talk with the folks there or online. You can reach out to us about these. There's ways that you can connect with people by receiving. Some you need to receive, and that's going to connect you through something like grief share. You've lost a loved one, and you can jump into grief share. You'll build relationships there. Lay counseling. We have counselors that will meet with you and walk with you for five weeks through whatever you're walking through and find biblical answers. We have Celebrate Recovery. People who have recovery issues, you'll find community there. And so there's ways you can receive, but also you can pour out and give. We have a meals ministry. We have a, a food pantry. We have a clothing closet. We go to senior centers. We have, and that's, those are just the big tip of the iceberg. There's so many things you can do where you can receive and grow relationally or give and grow relationally. And Christ is in the middle of all of that. So go to the tables in the courtyard and look at those before you leave or reach out to us if you're online. A second, I want to let you know that this Wednesday is the best Wednesday of the month. It's the first Wednesday of the month. It's Night of Worship. Last month, we had 18 baptisms in our Night, night of Worship. It was awesome. We're doing communion this Wednesday night at 615, worshiping in a song. I'm going to be bringing a message on 2 Samuel 22 about the song that David sang that is just blow your mind amazing. I've been having so much fun getting ready for the message coming up this Wednesday. So join us at 615 Wednesday night. If you are considering becoming part of Shoreline Church on a deeper level, you want to consider membership here online or on campus at 12.30, so in about 23 minutes. If you're online, just go and register right now on the website. If you're here, hang around and then head over to the Pacific Room, and we have a one-hour class that will kind of explain what membership is all about at Shoreline Church. If you need prayer today for anything, prayer is powerful. It means so much, and don't just take off. Connect relationally. If you're online you need prayer, you can live chat with your online host or you can email us on the email address you see on your screen right there. Email us your prayer needs and our prayer team will start praying for you and lifting you up. If you're on campus, anywhere on campus, just come in the worship center. On both sides there will be folks there along the walls and they would be overjoyed to pray with you and to lift you up. And if you're new at Shoreline, please don't miss this chance to connect. If you're online, just text the word welcome to the number you see on your screen right now, and we will reach out to you and build every bridge we can to get to know you and build a bridge to you. And if you're on campus, just go by the Connection Center right there in the lobby and just say the magic words, I'm new. It's not very complicated. They want to give you a gift bag. Thank you for coming and answer any questions you have. If you're able to stand online in the courtyard, family worship venue, in the worship center, if you can stand, will you stand with me and give me the honor of sending you off with a word of blessing? Amen. <laughs> Somebody snuck a dog in. <laughs> I'm hoping that was a dog barking and not a person. All right. As you go from this time together, may you connect deeply and richly with a God who made you and loves you. Let it all start there. And then may you go deeper with God's family, God's people. Make space. Get in those circles and connect with God's people. And then may you go out in the power of God and the strength of his family 
and shine the light of Jesus and share the love of Jesus everywhere you go. God bless you. Have a great day, and we'll see you Wednesday night at 6.15, night of worship. God bless you. Mm -hmm.